Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. In today's video, I want to talk about using Visual Studio Code instead of Visual Studio for writing ASP.NET Core applications. This can really apply to any kind of C-sharp applications, but I'm going to focus on ASP.NET Core. Before we get started, I did want to plug my courses coming up in April and May. In April, it is the 11th through 13th for ASP.NET Core. And in May, I'm going to be doing View and Invite together on the 9th through the 11th. You can see a link here to go see more information. A lot of us are using Visual Studio Code for certain things and not for others. I spend a lot of my time in Visual Studio as well as Visual Studio Code. In fact, I very normally would use Visual Studio for the ASP.NET Core piece and then Visual Studio Code for the JavaScript or TypeScript piece often having them both open to a similar project in the way that they're related. But I'm going to be talking about C Sharp specifically. Let's get started. So here we are in Visual Studio. A couple things I'll note is that I'm running way too many extensions. This is 85 right here. It's probably time for me to go ahead and dig in a little and remove some of these that I'm not using. But most importantly, I am using the C Sharp for Visual Studio Code. This is powered by OmniSharp, not by the same tooling that is used in Visual Studio. But you're going to see it's really capable. There's some other C Sharp related, but I'm not going to really focus on any of them. One of the things about using Visual Studio Code for ASP.NET and C Sharp in general is you're probably going to need to get more familiar with the command line. There's not going to be a file new project here, right? We can create a new workspace, but not really a new project. And so I'm going to focus here on the console for the moment, because what I want to do here is just use .NET and I'm going to say new, and I can say dash dash list, and it'll give me a list of templates that are installed. And you can see a lot of these for empty web project, for gRPC, etc., all the way down, including some React, Blazor, and even test projects, right? So a lot of the templates that you're used to using Visual Studio are still here. You're just going to need to use them via the command line. So in my case, I'm going to say .NET new, and I'm going to create an MVC application. This will be the standard controller-based MVC application. And I'm going to add a couple of parameters here. First, I'm going to do dash n so I can name it, and I'm going to call it fun in VS code. And I want to tell it where to output it. Normally, when we name it, it's going to put it in a directory based on that name. But I want it just in this folder raw, so I'm going to say create it here. And it's going to go through and actually generate all the same things that you're probably used to. And so if we make this a little smaller again, we can see that on the left side here, we're getting the same projects. We're getting the same files that we might be used to. There's views here for MVC. There's controllers for the defaults. And WWRoot contains things like the Bootstrap and jQuery that they use in the template by default. And we see this, one of the first things it's going to recommend for us to do is add the assets to build and debug the project. These are Visual Studio Code specific files so it knows how to build and run and debug the project. So go ahead and say yes. And you'll know they've been added because there's this new .vs code directory that has a few files, launch and tasks, which we won't really get into exactly what it's doing, but what it has done is allows us to go ahead and build the project. So if we just hit Control shift b just like in Visual Studio, it's going to go ahead and build that project for us. And we can go ahead and actually just hit F5 to run the project. But let's set a breakpoint someplace. So let's go to one of our controllers. And let's just stop right here before it creates the view, right? We can, just like we can in Visual Studio, we can add breakpoints. And when we go to debug, it should be a pretty familiar experience. So in this case, it stopped there. And on the left-hand side here, you're going to see all the things you're probably used to. So the, this object is going to be that controller. And we can dive down into each one of these. 
And you're going to get a very similar but much more simplified version of all these. The same sort of breakpoints can happen for all of these, but the tooling isn't going to be quite as dramatic as you might see from Visual Studio. One of the things I like about this is that it is lighter. A lot of times Visual Studio slows me down, and so I'd like to be able to do all of these different things directly here inside of Visual Studio Code. So I've done the simplest thing. I've created a project, I've run it, I've set a breakpoint, I've debugged it, all those very simple things you're going to want to do. But when you start to look at the way that the editor works, that is something else that's going to be important here. But before we talk about that, let me make sure and explain why I think Visual Studio Code for C Sharp is sometimes better. One of the things that is really enabled here is you could actually be running and debugging your projects directly in WSL2. So inside the Linux box and on Windows, you're going to be able to run code. And then from the Windows part, you can actually connect to that version so that as you're compiling and running, it's all happening inside of the Linux container. So when you're doing Linux specific or you want to make sure your project runs on Linux, this really represents an easy way to do that. So let's talk about the code editor. And you see some of the things you're probably already familiar with. References, uh, being able to click those and see where all it's actually being referenced. And in fact, you can still do F12 to go from the controller, or I'll show you here, find all references, find all implementations, or in my case, go to definition, F12, and this will do exactly what you've been used to in Visual Studio, which is it created a metadata class so you can really see the whole object and the documentation for that object. And of course, if you were using your own project, like here in error view model. If I come down here and I hit F12 on error view model, it's going to take me to my code as well. And so the basics of what we're talking about here is pretty simple once you've gotten this all up and running. But there are some other things that you're going to be doing that may feel a little weird when it comes to using Visual Studio Code. Because ordinarily I would want to be able to right click here and add a NuGet package, right? And there's no such thing here. In fact, we can go back to our console and do that. And for example, if I wanted to add a package, that's the command on .NET to do that. And then I could just do Microsoft, let's say Entity Framework, core dot SQL Server, right? And it will do what we're used to. It's not going to ask you to confirm the licenses, but we'll go ahead and add that. In fact, if we look at our CS proj, we'll see that it did exactly that. Add it to our project. Now we could write these manually as well if you prefer, but this means that you're not going to necessarily have the rich tooling that NuGet has. But once you start using this as add package, it might become more comfortable. And so the key here for me is that as you get more comfortable with the command line interface to .NET, specifically, things are going to slowly sort of evolve in your brain. But there's some things that you're just not going to be comfortable with, right? Doing .NET add package for, let's say, SQL Core Design, which is a common one you'll need. There's nothing here that's going to tell me that I might need design. You can see I'm using PowerShell here, and it's giving me some memory back to other times I've added a package called SQL Server like I just did. But there isn't a great way through the .NET interface to search for the packages you'll need. Of course, you can still use NuGet to search, but that's going to need to be a skill that you're going to get used to. So now that we've done that, I can go ahead and just use .NET build to make sure it still builds with our changes. And I could just do .NET run if I wanted to execute the project. I don't usually spend a lot of time when I'm working in Visual Studio running and using the debugger. When I get into a wall where I'm not happy with it, I might go ahead and use debugging when I've hit something difficult. But most of the time, I'm just going to actually use .NET watch. And .NET watch is going to build this project. And every time I make a change, it's going to inject that change if it can. Otherwise, it'll ask you if you want to restart. So let's go ahead and create a new foo equals foo. And when we saved it, you'll see it said file changed, hot load of changes succeeded. So it effectively swapped out the two pieces of code. This doesn't usually work well when you add a new piece like public eye action or result. Let's say contact page. 
return view. When I save that, oh, it is able to just add those references. That's nice. Sometimes it'll give you a complaint, especially if you do things like add a new file, where it says, I'm not sure what you want. Do you want to reload? And more importantly, do you want to always reload? Which is something that I'll often do and then just keep this hidden while I'm actually doing my the specific amount of coding I'm doing. So let's go ahead and comment this out. And so working with Visual Studio Code and Watch gives me that quick turnaround that I want as I'm writing code. A lot of the times it's just make a change, go back over to the browser, see if it's working in the way I want to, come back, make the change, because I'm doing a lot of small incremental changes as I work. That's sort of the nature of the way I work. I don't write a thousand lines of code and then hope it runs. That's usually not the way that I'm most comfortable working. And so this ends up being pretty useful. I'm going to go ahead and create a new console here because I can leave this running because I want to be able to add some new files to my project here. Now, I can always just go in here and say some controller if I wanted to just create a new controller. Notice it doesn't create any of the class structure that you want here. So what you often want to do is to use scaffolding. And there's a few different pieces to this. First of all, .NET new is not just for projects. And you'll see a uh, number of these, like solution file, web config, etc., are just files. And so let's actually do this. If I needed a .NET new solution, you can see it created a solution based on the name of the directory. And of course, I would go in here and say fun in VS code. Now, the solution isn't actually used by Visual Studio Code in any way, but if you want to allow this to be loaded or to have something that ties together a few projects. But if we look at the solution, we'll actually see if you understand this format, you actually see that there aren't any projects in it. And that's because all we did was create the solution file. And so if we want to add things to that, we'll need to do .NET solution which is its own command and essentially add list remove. So I'm going to say add and just point it at the CS proj. Now, if we look at this, we'll see it has that fun in code. It knows where it is. And if we opened this up in Visual Studio, it would be correctly created with that solution file. But it also allows us to create some files that are often part of startup of a project, at least for me. So I could say .NET new editor config, which is a common file for giving you the rules that this project should abide by. And you'll see it created it there with some decent defaults in it. This is also true for things like git ignore, and this will initialize a new git ignore in your project that is based on a C sharp project. And so here we can see that git ignore, and this is the typical one for a Visual Studio temporary files and such. I'm actually not using git in this directory, but a, a directory much further up the chain. So I'm going to get rid of that. But we can see that there are easy ways to do this. Now, the reality is a lot of times you're going to want to do something more. So if I went ahead and created a directory called utilities, let's go into that and say .NET new class, and I'll call this my utils. And you'll see here, by doing that, we're going to get a minimum class structure, just like if we created a new class. By the way, these CLI things I'm doing, these command line tool changes I'm making, will work when you're in Visual Studio as well. You'll just need to have access to a console, act, honestly. And sometimes it's faster than going add new file, bring up the wizard, find the file, all of that. I find it much more interesting. Now... As you're working with ASP.NET Core, you might be used to needing to create something more than that. And ASP.NET has its own set of templates that can be created. The things that are created through .NET New are somewhat limited here. They have a few things like mostly projects and has some basic things like interface and class and record. But what we really want to do is use tool to install and so to install it, we're just going to say .NET tool, install global .NET ASP .NET code generator. Now this says ASP.NET, it's actually for ASP.NET core. And what this allows us to do is say .NET 
ASP.NET code generator and do a bunch of different things that are specific to ASP.NET. So if I say help here, it's going to show me that has some simple arguments, what the project is, though we're in the same directory, so that's probably okay, what configuration, etc. And if I just call the generator itself, it will actually show me this error, right? This project needs Microsoft code generation that design package in order to use this. This is actually Visual Studio doesn't need this package in your project, but here's one where it does. So I'll say .NET add package, and I've just copied it, so I'll paste it in. Let's go ahead and call that code generator. And this is going to show you the different kinds of generators. You can create areas, controllers, you can add identity, you can create minimal APIs, and Razor page and view. Now what's interesting here is that these aren't just creating classes in the right place. If you'd already had a DB context and an EF model set, you could actually get this to create all of the actions, let's say minimal API or in controller for you. We don't, but let's go ahead and say .NET, ASP.NET code generator. And so let's say we want controller. And here's one I did earlier where I'm going to name it. This is going to be the name of the controller. It'll end up as error controller. I'm going to say this is for an API. You can also have ones that create views for them. And then I'm going to tell it where I want the folder. In this case, I want to tell it that it's relative to where I'm running it in this project, that it's going to be in the controller's directory. And I want to make sure that it has async and that it's using actions. And what does that do? Whenever you run these, it builds a project first because it may be relying on looking at metadata as part of your project. And it threw a bunch of errors and took a while. Well, why did it? Because we were over here still watching. And once we change the project or try to rebuild it in a different way, we're going to need to stop that. So let's do that. Let's come back over here and let's just do this one more time. Building a project should be much quicker this time. And you can see now we have an error controller. And this error controller has a lot of what we would expect in a controller. It has the four verbs because we told it wanted to be API. It tried to do the right thing with the route and the API controller, etc. The last thing I want to talk about is that because you're using Visual Studio Code, you might be able to use some extensions that are interesting. And the one I want to point out is this one called Thunder Client. Thunder Client is a Postman-like experience, but directly here in the project. So let's go ahead and open up and call this watch again. And you'll notice that this is the project URL, right? So I'm going to copy that and let's go ahead and create a new request. And if we just get the home page, obviously this will return 200 and give us our HTML back. So if you're seeing this, it should be very comfortable to do the same things you do in Postman. So if we go here and say API error, let's go ahead and send that as a get. It's going to actually return some sample data that the error controller already had. You'll notice that the simple get just returns an array of strings. And then we could do the same thing for ID post, put, delete, whatever it is. But it allows us to use these requests that we can actually save in the Thunder client as well and create even collections. Let's say we wanted to keep this as a collection. And you can see that the history is kept here. And I can go ahead and here say duplicate so I have a second one here. And then this one I could change to get error one, right? And test that as well. And by putting these in a collection, let's go ahead and just put this in a test collection. Then we'll see here in collections, we have tests with our object here. And what's interesting, let's go ahead and add this to that collection as well. If we save this one to that same collection, what I really like about this is that we can go into collections and we can actually tell it run all. So we can have a set of APIs that can run and see if any of them return fails. This isn't a replacement for unit tests, but as you're working on a project, this can be really useful in order to test out ideas as you're working with them. Make sense? So I've tried to show you some of the things about using this in ASP.NET Core, 
that might help you move to Visual Studio Code when you need to. Of course, if you're on a Mac or you're running Linux and want to run the same code, all of this is supported there. Visual Studio Code as well as installing the .NET SDK and be able to use these same commands. It's one of the reasons why Visual Studio Code ends up being a pretty good solution for that. Most of the time when I'm on Windows, I still do use Visual Studio a bit more often. I find it a little less touchy, especially when I'm working with multiple projects in a solution. They definitely do a better job than Visual Studio Code does. You can certainly get it going, especially you can certainly get it going if that's what you really need. I like to have both these tools at my disposal and try to figure out where using the best ones are. If you've gotten this far, of course, you're going to see I'm going to ask you to like and subscribe to my channel. Go ahead and like this video. It super, super helps. And if you have any questions, go down into the comments. I try to answer them pretty quickly. In addition, I am holding these two new courses in April and May. You'll see a link here in the bottom of the screen. Feel free to go there and take a look at what I'm doing. I'd appreciate that. Again, this has been Sean Wildermuth for Coding Shorts. See you next time. Thank you.